So welcome to week seven of the course. This is also really the last week of unit two, and I know that we don't really think of this course in terms of units in the online version of this class anyway. But I think it is important to be aware of times in the course where we are shifting our attention. And so this is going to be the last week that we'll really spend on the Greeks. They've, they've gotten so much attention so far. Starting next week, we're going to move away in some ways from the Greeks. But this is our last week really focused on Greek culture. And within this week, we're going to be talking about the transition from the classical Greek world, which is what we've been talking about the last several weeks, into this period known as the Hellenistic period. Hellenistic meaning Greek-like. So we'll be getting to that, especially in my next video. This video is about Aristotle. And Aristotle is a product of classical Greece. He's on the late side of things, but he is part of the classical Greek era. I'll also just remind you that there is a lecture from Dr. Kennison on Aristotle that you're assigned this week. So in addition to watching this video, it wouldn't be a terrible idea, although it's not necessary, to watch his video on Aristotle before you gear up. I'll also just remind you that you want to pay especially close attention to this video because your essay for the week is on Aristotle. And part of what I'm trying to do in this video is to help orient you for that reading, help prepare you for wrestling with it, but not in such a way that I kind of do the assignment for you. So um, bear that in mind as, as I talk. Okay, a little bit about Aristotle. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth in, into his life story. He was born in 384 BC. So again, it's the classical period, but it's after the Golden Age of Athens. It's after Athens has suffered a tremendous defeat in the Peloponnesian War. Now, Aristotle was from a region uh, known as Macedonia, and that's a region we'll be talking about a lot this week. But he spent most of his career, not all of it, but most of it in Athens. He was never technically an Athenian citizen, but he was very much immersed in Athenian culture. More specifically, from 367 to 347, anyway, he was a student at the Academy, which, of course, was Plato's philosophical school in Athens. Learned a ton from Plato, as you might expect. Admired a great deal about Plato, but also was willing to disagree with Plato on some pretty serious points. So he's no slavish disciple uh, at all. Um, although I should say, since you're going to read from Aristotle's Ethics this week, I should say that when it comes to moral matters, I think Aristotle and Plato are quite close to one another. For instance, I don't think there's a lot in this week's reading from Aristotle that Plato would disagree with. He might want to emphasize things a little bit differently or something, but um, I think they're pretty close in ethical issues. When it comes to metaphysics, the nature of reality, that's when there's going to be more serious disagreements, and you'll hear more from Dr. Kinnison about that. Well, Plato dies in 347, and after that, Aristotle leaves Athens for a while, goes back to Macedonia, and becomes a tutor for none other than Alexander the Great himself. So this is a pretty good gig that Aristotle has. Now, Alexander himself is sort of the hinge between the classical and the Hellenistic period. So you can see how Aristotle is, um, in some ways, also kind of a, a hinge figure. Well, in 334, Aristotle returns to Athens and starts his own school, a school known as the Lyceum, L-Y-C-E-U-M, Lyceum. Um, you may, if you know French, you know this is where the French get their word for school, they say. Well, Alexander 
one of our major figures for the week. Alexander is going to die in 323, and Aristotle will die one year later in 322. So really it's the death of these two figures, the death of Alexander, the death of his teacher Aristotle, that is, is often seen as the, the point at which the classical age gives way to the Hellenistic age. All right. Well, you're reading book two of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics this week. So I want to say a little bit about that to, to get you ready for that. The first thing to know is that the title is not really significant. It's called the Nicom Nicomachean Ethics, but we're not sure if Nicomachus was maybe the uh, person that Aristotle dedicated the work to, or maybe an early editor of the work. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about it. Aristotle scholars often refer to this work just as the ethics, and so that, that's, that'll work for us, too. A bit of warning before you start to read Aristotle. Aristotle is not an easy read, and especially since you're writing an essay on Aristotle, you might want to plan on reading that text at least twice. The reason why Aristotle is not a terribly easy read is because he probably never intended for his writings to be published in the form that we have them. What we have, what you are reading, is basically a set of lecture notes that Aristotle had prepared for himself. And as any teacher knows, what's in your lecture notes and what you actually say in the classroom can be quite different. So what we are reading was never really meant to be published, at least in that form. And that's why I think that in some places Aristotle, you sort of expect him to elaborate a little bit more, maybe to offer some more illustrations, which he probably did off the cuff when he was teaching in the Lyceum, but all we have are the notes. So it's a very kind of compressed style. So... Um, Perhaps your experience will be different. I always find Aristotle a more challenging read than Plato for that very reason. Okay, so what is this reading about? You're reading book two of the Ethics. What's it about? Well, in short, it's about how to become a good and virtuous person. How do you do that? How do you become a good, virtuous person? Good actions are important. But Aristotle is not simply interested in telling us, oh, it would be a good idea to do that, or this, or don't do this. Um, he, he's really more in, interested in um, actually, you know, becoming good. Um, not just doing good things, but becoming a good person. So for Aristotle, in a way, the ultimate ethical question is not what should I do or what should I not do. The ultimate ethical question is what sort of person ought I, be, ought I to become? That's what he's most interested in. And I want you to stress, or I want you to notice as you read, just how practical Aristotle is. Now, I mean, a book like this is going to be practical in one sense because it's about ethics, and ethics is practical, right? It's about action, behave, human behavior. But it's practical in another sense, too. Aristotle is very clear that he doesn't want people just to grasp intellectually what they ought to do if they want to become a good person. He is writing this so that people will not just understand things with their mind, but that people would actually put into practice what he is suggesting in this book. He says in, um, at one point in your reading that the many think that one becomes good by having the best arguments. And what he wants to say is that, no, that actually doesn't have anything to do with it. You can have all the best moral arguments and still not be a good person. So what do we really need to do? For Aristotle, if philosophy is not lived out, then it is not real philosophy. So he really wants what he's talking about here to be put into practice. Well, a little background 
Um, we're reading book two. We're not reading book one. So I want to say a little bit about what's in book one because I think it's important and I think you ought to know it. In book one, he asked, in some ways, the most basic ethical question of all, a question that, you know, probably most of us have asked at some point in our lives, which is, why should I bother being good at all? Why should I do it? It's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. Why? Why should I become good? That's the question he's addressing in book one. And his answer is, is quite simple. You want to become good because only if you are good and virtuous can you be happy. Happiness consists of virtuous activity. Now, you need some other things, too. I mean, Aristotle was clear that you need uh, basic you know, food, shelter, and other sorts of material resources. But even if you have those things and you're not virtuous, you will never really be happy. Now, you could say that this is a selfish motivation for being good, that uh, we ought to be good just because we ought to, but that's not really a very satisfying answer anyway. Aristotle would say, look, it's not about being selfish. Okay, being virtuous is not ultimately about being selfish. It's simply a, it's a matter of being true to our nature as human beings. Now, this is something that Dr. Kennison will talk a little bit about in his lecture, that for Aristotle, everything has a final cause. A final cause is simply the reason for something's existence. It's purpose. Everything has a purpose. So it's the purpose of the acorn to become an oak tree. It's the purpose of a watch to tell time. It's the perfect, it's the, the final end of human beings to be happy. And to be happy by being virtuous. So that sets up our reading, book two. Now we know why we ought to bother being virtuous to begin with. Now we need to know, okay, you've convinced me, Aristotle. I ought to be good. How do I go about that? So book two. If you look at your essay assignment this week, you'll see that I'm asking you in your essay to answer three basic questions based on your reading of book two of the ethics. The first big question is what is virtue? I've been talking a lot about virtue. I haven't actually defined it and different philosophers might define it in different ways. Now you might be interested in knowing that the Greek word for virtue, the word, the word that, um, that Aristotle is actually using here is arete, which is a word that you have encountered in the Odyssey, right? Queen Arete. And Arete can be translated a number of different ways, but for our purposes, we'll translate it as excellence. Okay. Virtue is excellence. And of course, not just any kind of excellence, because there's athletic excellence and artistic excellence and all that. No, it's moral excellence. That's what we're talking about when we talk about virtue. But I want you to be looking, as you read, for a definition, because Aristotle is going to give you a definition. Now, the definition is pretty dense. It's pretty compressed. So in your essay, what you're going to need to do is not just spout off the definition that he gives, but unpack it a bit um, and explain what it means. Put it in your own words. After you've defined it, you need to further sort of fill out his notion of virtue by giving a, a, a couple of examples of specific virtues that he cites. Um, so what are a couple of specific virtues that he cites and why does he cite those virtues specifically? One last thing to be looking for, because this is something you will want to mention when you talk about what virtue is for Aristotle, and it has to do, he says, with aiming for the mean. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that means, but I'm just going to tell you I'm going to expect that in your essay, you're going to talk about that and explain to me what he means when he says that virtue always aims for the mean. Now, that's not a complete definition of virtue for Aristotle. You're going to need me to tell me more than that, but you want to include that for sure. 
The second big question I want you to address in your essay is sort of the next logical question. So now I know what virtue is. So the question is, how do I acquire it? How do I get it? How do I become virtuous? And this is a necessary question because Aristotle was quite clear in the reading that no one is virtuous by nature. Okay? It's not like, you know, some people who are just kind of like really athletic by nature and, you know, lucky them. Um, no, it's something that everybody is going to have to work at. Now, the good news is that everybody has the capacity to be virtuous. So, naturally speaking, everybody has that ability, but everybody's going to have to acquire virtue, and for everybody, it's going to be hard. It is going to take effort and work. And this is why he um, compares becoming virtuous to something like becoming a, a master carpenter. Uh, again, nobody is good at carpentry simply by nature. It's a craft that one has to learn and one has to put in time and effort and energy and all that. The third question that I ask you to address in the essay is, I, again, the next logical question, I think, which is, okay, well, now I know what virtue is. Now I know how to go about acquiring it. But, this is question number three, how do I know when I actually have it? In other words, how do I know that I've become a virtuous person? A question you have to ask yourself when reading Aristotle is, if I do something virtuous, let's say I do something generous, does that make me automatically a generous person? I think if you read Aristotle carefully, his answer to that will be quite clear. And, well, I'll just go ahead and tell you this much. He says, no, right? Doing something brave or doing something generous does not automatically make you a brave or generous person. So that just raises the question, okay then, how in the world do I know if I, if I actually brave rather than just being a cowardly person who did something brave? Um, so be looking for that as you read. That's the last kind of piece of the puzzle because if you know that, then you really know everything you need to know to get started in the moral life. You know what virtue is, you know how to get it, and you know how to measure your own progress. Because if you can't measure your progress, then how, do you, how could you possibly know? But, but Aristotle thinks you can. So be looking for that. There's something else I want you to be thinking about as you read Aristotle, as you ponder Aristotle. This is not something I expect you to include in the essay, but it is something I want you to be thinking about. And that is, what do we do with Aristotle as Christians? For one thing, Aristotle is living several centuries before the time of Christ, so he's not really influenced. I mean, he's not influenced by Christianity at all. Um, and you might also say, well, look, isn't the Bible sufficient for moral guidance, right? Why would any Christian today want to read some pagan Greek looking for moral guidance? formation uh, when you have the Bible right there in front of you. So I you know, think about these questions. And as you do that, I think you'll, you'll note that there are some areas of overlap between the moral teaching of the Bible and, and the moral teaching of Aristotle. Um, several of the virtues, the, several of the things that Aristotle considers virtues are considered um, to be virtues in the Bible as well. Things like uh, courage, again, um, temperance, generosity. Okay? These are things that Aristotle praises. These are also things that the Bible praises. I also talked about how Aristotle was more interested in character than in uh, particular moral actions, and I think that's largely true of the Bible as well. Now, of course, we all know there are thou shalt nots and thou shalts throughout the Bible. But take a text like the Beatitudes for a moment, famous text from Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus says, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, and so on. Uh, I want to mention two things about that. One is that 
the Greek word that we often see translated as blessed, makarios, can also mean happy, right? Happy are the meek. Happy are the poor in spirit. And of course, that comports very well with Aristotle's notion that only virtues will make us truly happy. We only become truly happy when we're virtuous. Um, but also notice that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount um, isn't really just talking about people who do a few um, peacemaking deeds or people um, who uh, you know occasionally show acts of mercy. No, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the people who have cultivated a merciful character. So you see that same kind of emphasis on character that we see in, um, in Aristotle. So just think about this for a moment. Uh, take a text that everybody knows, Proverbs 22, 8, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. This is also quoted by Paul in 2 Corinthians 9. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Well, as we all know from experience, Giving is one thing. Giving cheerfully is definitely something else. So the question is, okay, God, we know you want us to be cheerful givers, but that's a hard thing to just command yourself to do, right? Look at yourself in the mirror and say, by gum, I'm going to give cheerfully today. That's really hard to do. Um, so how do you become a cheerful giver? How does that work? Does it happen magically? Does it happen automatically? Um, or is it just impossible? And I think Aristotle has some guidance for us here, right? I think he would say, look, if you want to be a cheerful giver, then start giving, right? Give and give and give. Um, at first, you may not be so cheerful about it, but that should change over time. Um, so I, I think there are places where Aristotle might be ha might have some wisdom for us. Now, I should hasten to say that we should not expect perfect congruence between Aristotle's ethical teachings and the Bible's ethical teaching. For instance, there are certain qualities that the Bible considers to be virtues that Aristotle would not consider to be a virtue at all. And I think the best example here would be humility. Clearly, especially in the New Testament, humility is a virtue for Aristotle, uh, not really so much. So there may be conflict in terms of specific virtues. And I think the more profound difference between Christian teaching on morality and Aristotle's teaching is that Christian teaching uh, openly acknowledges that we cannot make ourselves good solely by using our own resources. We need divine assistance. We need um, aid from God. And of course, we have a theological word for that. And it's grace. Right? This is pretty much uh, universal Christian teaching. We need God's grace in order to, um, to become good moral people. And of course, Aristotle, for obvious historical reasons, does not have that sense. For Aristotle, we are pretty much left to our own devices when it comes to the moral life. So hopefully that'll start you thinking about these questions. Um, I do certainly think Aristotle has a lot to offer Christians today, and I also think that there are some real limitations. So um, um, good luck with that reading. Let me emphasize, and I say this on the assignment, that uh, please use me as a resource as you are working on your essay. This is a real challenging assignment. You're, 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 you are reading Aristotle, and you are having to make sense of him, and that will not always be easy. So if I can help, please let me know. You can contact me any number of ways, and I will be quick to respond and quick to help. All right, thanks.